there and welcome to the Read All Over Show presented by Lit Carney Bell and me, your host, Toy Thomas, author, blogger, and reading advocate. Let's meet today's guest. I am so excited to share one of my favorite authors. J.H. Moncrief is the girl who runs towards the haunted house instead of running away. Let's meet J.H. Moncrief. All right. I am so glad to be talking with you today, (laughs) J.H. Me too. I'm so glad to meet you finally. I know. I've been wanting to like have a conversation with you forever. You know, I'm like one of your biggest fans. I have all of your work. (laughs) Uh, And it's, I'm so honored, uh, honestly, that you like my work. I think that's amazing. I do. I love it. Um, So before I get into my whole, you know, geek thing, why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Oh boy, where to start? Uh, Well, my name is J.H. Moncrief. I write dark fiction. So uh, some traditional horror, uh, but a lot of supernatural suspense, ghosts, witches, that kind of thing. And I'm also on several true crime shows now as a writer expert. So that's an interesting diversion. I saw you on the cruise ship killers and I like freaked out. And my husband didn't know why I was freaking out. I was like, ah! He's like, what are you doing? Like, it's my favorite author. She's on TV. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Yeah, there's two more now. I'm probably not even supposed to talk about, but there's two different shows now. So it's crazy. Now I'm on three. (laughs) I know. It's so cool. (laughs) All right. So let's go ahead and get into this. So um, the reason I started doing this interview series is because I'm an avid reader. I love reading. And I think people should read more than they do. And so I always start out asking questions about you as a reader. It's called On the Bookshelf. And I know we have some questions that were submitted from your TikTok community. So we'll start with that. (laughs) What book inspired you to start writing? Oh, wow. What book inspired me to start writing? Honestly, um, I've been writing almost from the time like I I guess I must have been reading, but I was five when I started writing. Uh, But there was a time when I was in my early 20s, I was a freelance journalist, and I was incredibly busy with it. And I used it as as an excuse not to write fiction, because I'd be like, I'd write all day. And then I'd come home. And the last thing I wanted to do was get on the computer again and write. And On Writing by Stephen King is the book that got me writing again after years of not writing my own work. Uh, Well, I guess journalism was my own, but not the same. Right. So in the very beginning, I mean, I was raised on my mom's old Nancy Drew and Bobsy twin books from the fifties, I guess. And uh, first scary book I read was uh, there was a series. They're actually starting to reprint them. Uh, that was called ghosts and then there was one called monsters and then there was one called ufos that i found in my library and they scared the living daylights out of me (laughs) nightmares but i love them and they've reprinted them so that's really exciting um but those were probably like i don't remember really fairy tales but like richard scary books oh yeah willows uh those types of things um there's a poet here in canada who wrote uh, this great book called Alligator Pie and Garbage okay. Delight. Um, <laughs> is, so the, the, he definitely, Dennis Lee is his name. So that they definitely influenced me as well. But even, even kids' poetry was kind of creepy back then. It was, yeah. <laughs> I have a book of kids' poetry and only half of it makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah. Try Dennis Lee, seriously, I think you'd like him. Okay, Dennis Lee, cool. So my other question that I have for you is um, this one, not everybody may be able to answer this one. So we'll just see. Um, Is there a banned book that you are a huge fan of? Now, I just want to preference for any viewers that are following books get banned for many different reasons. And a lot of times it's a bunch of hooey. So with that said, is there a banned book that you're like a huge fan of? It's interesting you ask this because I just started really looking into a banned book and I started looking into it because it was banned. It, it got on my radar because it was banned and it's called Mouse. Um, I, oh my goodness, I just got that book. Oh, let me know what you think. Uh, I haven't read it yet, so I can't say I'm a big fan, but I'm a big fan of the concept I've seen 
uh, quite a bit of the panels and a bit of the story and just the fact that got banned is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, like, like we're trying to keep kids in a bubble that they should know bad things happened in the world. And that's probably the most dangerous thing you can do. I think, yeah. um, I'm trying to think of other books I know that got banned. Give me a few titles. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't can't. Oh, so I think, um, to, to kill a mockingbird. Have you ever read that? That book yes. was banned at one point. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, um, yes. Handmaid's Tale, that book has been banned. Yeah. That I can see, I guess. There's, you know, and there's so many different reasons why, why books get banned. I mean, I've read through some of the articles on some of them and like, sometimes I get like where people are coming from, but I feel like they take things maybe a little too far. I get if you have a book that has content that you're concerned about children reading that's meant for adults. However, I don't think it should be banned. You just don't let your kids read it. Let other people, you know, like, I don't know. I just, I, I really, when it comes to this whole idea of like censorship, it worries me just because I have a certain set of beliefs and I wouldn't want someone saying that I couldn't read what I wanted to read. So I'm not going to do that to someone else. Absolutely. And how do you, I mean, now the way the world is going, everyone's talking about diverse perspectives and, and getting other perspectives and seeing how other people view the world and isn't censorship the opposite of that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love, yeah. Whew. Not want to get into that too much, but, um, <laughs> but no, yeah, I, 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 I can't believe that that's the book you picked. I literally, I got that. And um, there's two volumes. I got both of the volumes and I haven't cracked it open yet, but I, I'm definitely going to read that. <laughs> I'm jealous. I, I really do want to read it. Definitely. I've put, I put, I put it on the list of my library. Like it, it's, I'm on the waiting list. There's, it's insane. We have so many copies, but the waiting list for it is huge. So I might get next year. <laughs> well, you know, I think, like you said, I think a lot of people became interested in it once they heard that it was banned. I, I feel like sometimes these, these bands, I don't know if they're strategic or not, but they're actually helping these books get exposure. I don't know if it's doing what they want it to do. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. When I was a kid, I remember the Satanic Bible. I think I was pretty young. The Satanic Bible got banned and the author went into exclusion because he had death threats and stuff like that. So I've always wanted to read that book just because of that. Yes, and as far as I know, yeah, have you read that? No. <laughs> as far as I know, it has nothing to do with Satanism at all. It's just the title. Yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes, like I said, people do things with like a certain intention and it does the absolute opposite. And I think sometimes if you, if there's something that if you don't give a lot of attention to it, that's when it kind of goes into obscurity, but by, you know, saying, no, you can't read that. Of course people are going to read it. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. One of the best things my mom ever did was she never censored anything I read. So, you know, I, and look how well I turned out. <laughs> My mom didn't censor what I read, but she did lose a couple of my library books, and I'm still mad about that to this day. Because <laughs> <laughs> she borrowed them? No, because she lost them, and I had to pay the fines. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> All right, so let's go into our next segment, and um, this is the open book. This is where we get to learn a little bit about your writing process. Oh, um, the first question that I have here, is there anything unusual about your writing process? Oh man, I think everything's unusual. <laughs> uh, with me, I, I normally, it's a little different now that I'm writing series because each book sort of sets up the next book, uh, whether I like it or not. But originally what would happen is I'd come up with a what if idea, like um, I'm trying to think of an example, like what if your friend, best friend disappeared in high school and you never knew what happened to her, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd come up with a what if, and then I just wait, uh, for a couple of days, maybe a week. And soon that character would introduce themselves to me and start talking to me, almost like another voice is talking in my head. And all I have to do really is take dictation. Yeah. That's all I have to do and trust them, uh, because I always get to the middle and I get freaked out. Even now, I think I've written, I'm working on my 22nd book. 
So even now I'll get to the middle, not know the end and freak out. Uh, it's like, how can I, I don't know the end, but I never know the end. It's like the character has to tell me. Yeah. The only, the only difficulty is if I stop writing for a period of time, which happens because life, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's almost like, imagine if you were talking to someone on the phone and you just said, hang on, and you left them there for a month, you know, trying to pick up that conversation again. It's like that. It's very like after a break until you get the rhythm going again. Um, But yeah, that's probably the most challenging thing. But I don't have a plot. I don't have an outline. I don't have any. And it's so funny, like I've been asked to be on panels uh, where I'm obviously the ugly stepchild, right? Because they have, they'll have, uh, they'll, they'll call it like a pantsers versus plotters. And I'll get on this panel and I'm the only pantser, which for <laughs> any of your viewers don't know, it just pantser means writing by the seat of your pants, which is right. kind of insulting in a way. It's like, sort of like we don't have a process. Uh, but they'll say there'll be all these plotters and they'll be saying stuff like, well, you can't pants a series. Yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> now that's a mystery really uh it's just I, I find it so interesting how many people who don't write this way think that they can tell people who write this way what we can and cannot do it's like how do you know you're an outliner I wouldn't presume to tell an outliner how to do their work like right but that's how it works for me and that's how it's always worked for me I don't I can't be one of those you know all that writing in advice they give you like oh sit down and plan your characters and decide what jobs they have and all that I can't do that you just have to let it come to you yeah yeah they are who they are <laughs> well this and of course this me, me being a fan of your work I'm wondering you have a series, um, the Ghostwriter series, which is actually expanding a little bit to, it's almost like, <laughs> this is the geek in me. It's almost like you're creating your own universe of characters. Like you have that series and now you have a spinoff series. Like, how did that come about? Like, I know you didn't plan it, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Um, actually it came about in an interesting way, I think. I was interviewing a, I have a friend who mentioned that she was a witch. And my first thought was like, okay, <laughs> yeah, all right. Mm. Uh, but she was a really interesting person. And somewhere along the way, I can't remember why. I think I was hard up for blog material. And I thought, you know, I should interview you about this. And wow, did that open my eyes? Like it was nothing like I thought of. And she started talking about all this stuff about how the power had been taken away from women and witches were the knowledge keepers and the healers and everything. And that had been stolen from them. And I was like, wow, this is actually a real female empowerment thing, which I like, I was still thinking witches, like you see them in horror movies. Right. Uh, So she really like just opened my eyes. And I, I just started thinking and I thought, Laura, the character in Ghost Writers, it's like, she's a witch. She's obviously a witch. There's a part in one book. I don't want to spoil anything, but I'm like, it, it was supposed to be a group of psychics. And looking back, I'm like, that was a coven. That was totally a coven. <laughs> yes, because when you when you had her, I guess, I don't know, come out as a witch to the Jackson character, I kept thinking that scene makes so much more sense now because that's what it was. And I was just like, I wonder if she planned it this way like that was so and because I had followed your blog and saw the interview you know that you did with the witch I was just like (gasps) (laughs) yeah I know I swear toy it's like it's almost like this is probably gonna make me sound insane but it's almost like they're real and they they have their own plan and they have their own they know who they are but I've got to catch up right so it, when she so what, once I knew that she was a witch I'm like I would really like to write a series about witches and witches had never been anything I was interested in before I thought witches were kind of dumb like like you know the whole hocus pocus right. thing like yeah. I wasn't into that at all I thought they were boring and but but real witches like my friend like all the um, herbal medicine and the crystals and just like what you believe and whether you have a deity or you don't have a deity and that I found that fascinating and the history fascinating so an actual magic 
you know, how magic is really supposed to be if you believe it exists. I found that like playing with energy in the world and, and if, and impacting positive negative energy, I thought this is really interesting and it ties perfectly into what Kate and Jackson are learning to do. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's how that happened, but I've always planned to have a YA spinoff with Lily, uh, which is very slow to come. And, okay. and then there's the spinoff with the Egyptian, the ancient Egyptian side with Enid stuck in. Okay. See, I love, oh. see, oh my goodness. I'm just learning so much. I'm getting so excited because I was wondering what happened with Lily and the, oh, see, we got to stop because I could just, we could be talking about this all day and there's other stuff to talk about, but um, no, I think that's wonderful how, you know, you had that connection with this person and it influenced your story and you let the character just evolve. And I, that's wonderful. I love that. <laughs> well, and I love um, one of the characters in the witch books. Her, She ends up, I'd set him up. I thought he was, this is the thing. My characters always prove me wrong. I think something and I'm wrong. I thought Job was going to be a bad guy. I, I thought he was <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was gonna be nasty. And then all of a sudden he's like this seductive hunky. I'm like, is this a romance? Am I writing a romance? What's going on here? But yeah, he ended up actually kind of being an anti-hero and not even as anti as I thought he would. <laughs> that's, so. that's gotta be so surprising. I mean, I know as a as a reader, it's surprising. So knowing that, you know, you are a pantser when you write, like when you're writing these things, it's gotta be like, ah, like an aha moment as you're writing it. So. Oh, very much. I, Oracle, I was terrified the whole time because I'd really painted myself into a corner with Carol of Ghosts. I'm like, what am I going to do for Oracle? How in the heck is he going to save the world? He's only one person. That was brutal. Yeah, <laughs> it was brutal reading it. You, you saw my review. <laughs> but no, it was great. I loved it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I imagine. But I just... You know, I want to make it clear at the end of the book that it's not always going to be about saving the world. Don't worry, we're going to go back to ghosts because, yeah, that could get, I was trying to make it not really heavy. Like, I don't think people come to my reading for deep, you know, environmental treaties on saving the planet. No, I don't, I don't, when I read your work, I always expect there to be, and, it, and I don't know that this is intentional or not, this is just my experience as the reader is that there's always something kind of underlying that's insightful, something that you can take away from. Yes, it's a work of fiction, but I always feel like when I read your work, I feel, it's, I feel like it's very considerate. Like you take a lot of things into consideration and um, anyone who reads your work, if they don't walk away having been like a, you know, impacted somehow, that's on them, not you. <laughs> Because I feel like, I think it's, I think it's, I can't remember, I, I said in one of your reviews that I really liked how you had portrayed like all these different cultures um, in a way that was just, the way we don't really see a lot now, you know, especially in the news media, it's, it's one against the other and all this kind of stuff, whereas you kind of present this harmony that isn't perfect, but it lets you know that you can have these differences and still there can be a harmonious balance to it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for saying that. You, you wrote one review. I think it was the first one where you said uh, you recommended it for people who love diverse fiction. And that honestly was the best compliment I could be given because I'm always terrified, you know, looking the way I do. Sometimes people like me aren't, it's, our work is an embrace if we're writing about different cultures and ethnicities. And so I'm always scared of that. But at the same time, I have to let my characters be who they are and tell their story. And I, I honestly, in the, when I was writing the first book, I didn't know Jackson was black. <laughs> I didn't know until like, halfway through and then he was like my name's Jackson Stone are you a moron of course I'm black you know uh, but I had to go back and change like he had bed head in, in one of the chapters so I had to go and change that and I gave him a shaved head and and then I had to like um, talk to you know thankfully I had a friend from Trinidad who was living in China so I interviewed her and said like how do people treat you are they because the experience is different right um, and I've seen it, I've been there with her and everybody wants to touch her hair and everybody wants to take a photograph with her. Like they ignored me. She was yeah. the, everyone was like, oh, you're going to be, you know, people are going to look at you because you have red hair. I'm like, are you kidding? Like, it was like, she was a celebrity. Everybody wanted a photo with her. And it's, it's, it's taking the time to do that. 
um, or have sensitivity readers like in those who came before. I, I find it like I try, I would never want to make um, someone who's already struggling make their life worse by reading my books or make them feel misrepresented. And I know I'm always taking a risk, yeah. um, but I try, I try my best. Um, with Temple of Goes, again, I didn't expect to have a Muslim character. Uh, but I'd recently been to Egypt and our guide was Muslim. And there was a period of time where he took us into a mosque, had us all take off our shoes and we're sitting in a mosque. And he started telling us about what he believed about like the tenets of Islam. And it blew my mind because he was like talking about how, you know, when you don't have anything, you give that to someone. And the idea is that you will get it back, you know, and it just the generosity and the peace and the love. And I remember thinking, wow, if everybody could do this, what a different world it would be. So I always want to try and I, I also teach international students. So I'm always exposed to cultures from around the world and different ways of thinking. And it's just, I always think, wow, everybody should have to do this because yeah. it, yeah, it changes. I think I was already open to it, but there was, um, I don't want to go on too much, but there was one moment I went to lunch and I came back and there was a Muslim student. It sounds like the star of a joke, but there was a Muslim student, a Jewish student from, from actually Israel, had come here from Israel and a Christian student from Egypt. And they were talking. And when I came in the room, the Jewish student looked at me and he was like, we have so much in common. We believe the same things. And I just, again, I went like, what if everybody could do this? You know, what if everybody could get exposed to that? Like how different the world would be? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, and again, this is just my experience. I can't speak for everyone. I feel like when I read your work, I, I get that sense that you have taken, you know, all of these things into consideration. And I just really, I enjoy it. I appreciate it. I think your stories are great by themselves, but also having that feeling while I'm reading it just makes it even so much better. Thank you. But if I get anything wrong, don't be shy about telling me. <laughs> oh, I will. I will. <laughs> um, so let's get into the next part. Um, we're actually going to, we, we, we kind of already have been doing this, but I have like some specific questions about some of your work. Um, kind of hard not to do that since I'm such a fan, <laughs> but we're moving into what I call the book signing. And so I want to talk about some of the characters you've created in your books. Um, which of your characters, if you could be friends with them in real life, would you be friends with and why? Jackson. <laughs> Jackson because he's uh I love how sarcastic he is uh, I love his dry wit and he's not like I love Kate too but she be, she would be a little bit too prim and proper for me I think uh there's just she's got an edge too uh but Jackson's my kind of guy like I I I, I deal well with people of like slightly off color humor and aren't afraid to offend people and are always getting in trouble like my heart always goes out to people like that so definitely Jackson. I think Laura would drive me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because I was thinking, you know, about this question. And when I originally started reading the series, my answer right away would have been Kate. And, but as I've read this, of course, I still like Kate. Jackson has grown on me a lot more because I was like, oh, he's, he's too hot headed, you know, but um, I actually think I would be friends with Laura just because I need a friend like her because I'm so like introverted and quiet and she would, I feel like she would inspire me to, you know, do things that I wouldn't do without her being there pushing me. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. I, she's definitely a very positive person. Mm -hmm. I think I would always be afraid that she'd find me negative because I can't be as sunny as she is. <laughs> yeah, she is super positive. <laughs> um, oh, so here's another question that I have. Um, it's just kind of a quirky thing. I, I do this, so that's why I'm asking the question. When you have to do like a public appearance and you're going to talk about your work or maybe do a reading or something, do you have like an accessory, or an article of clothing or some kind of, you know, totem that you have with you when you do these public appearances? Oh, man, I wish I did. You do? 
I do. <laughs> oh, what do you have? I have a bookmark that it's, oh. it's my favorite bookmark. It's a wooden bookmark that my husband got for me. And I take it with me and I, I keep it in like, if I have to do a reading, I keep it in the book that I'm going to do the reading from. Or, and even when I don't, I just have it with me. Like sometimes I'll put it out on my table, just kind of as a reminder. I don't know. It just, I take my little bookmark with me. That's so nice. I, there's been certain uh, pieces of jewelry at times that I've thought were lucky, uh, but they change. I put an Amazonite in my purse once thinking that uh, uh, it would bring me courage. But when it comes to readings and launches and that, I just try to, that my thought is more to wear something genre appropriate. So like, I don't know if you can see, but there's spider webs on the I, shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I, always, I always try to wear something that um, that will appease the fans of ghost stories and that sort of thing. So whether it's boots with a haunted house on them or, or that I could barely walk in, that was fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wish there was. It would be really cool to have one thing that's like that you always carry. But unfortunately, I don't. I wish I did. I think for me, the bookmark worked for me just because I, even though I've been doing this a long time, I still feel like I'm a young writer because I'm constantly trying to learn and grow, you know, develop my um, skill or whatever, but I was a reader first. And so having that bookmark reminds me that even if I am out there trying to, you know, speak about my writing, I'm doing it because someone's reading it. And that that bookmark reminds me that always, you know, keep the readers in mind because they're the ones reading it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Without without readers, it's a pretty lonely life. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now I have um, a part of my interview process that I call the silly section. <laughs> And so some of these questions um, are just going to be random, but the first one is actually one from your TikTok community. And this one I'm very excited about. <laughs> what is the most frightening thing you've experienced while researching your books? Oh, I'm glad you had the last part in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably going to Pavilia. So for those of you who don't know, Pavilia is considered to be the most haunted island in the world. And I went there by myself for, I think it was two and a half hours. And that is, uh, I don't scare easily. Like there is no horror movie ever that has scared me, unfortunately. I wish they did, but they don't. <laughs> um, but in Pavilia, I was like this the whole time. Like, you're okay. You're okay. <laughs> uh, it, the feeling there was terrifying it was just such a heavy feeling in, in some buildings more than others once I got used to certain buildings I felt safer there but the asylum there was just something it was just there was just this foreboding in there but honestly I was more scared of somebody else being on the island because it was it wasn't until I was there without a cell phone, without a flashlight, <laughs> with all these things that I started realizing, what if someone else is on this island? Like, I've got no way to call for help. I've got no way to get away from them. Like, so you're kind of, you're creeping around. Everything's really overgrown. And so you're creeping through these overgrown and there's thorns. And the first thing that happened when I got there was I cut myself on a thorn and right away I'm thinking of a horror movie, right? Like first blood on the island. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're creeping around, like trying to like get your bearings and get through these thorns and everything while you're looking for a mass grave. And it just, it would occur to me like, what if somebody just like comes around the corner? Like I would lose my mind, even if they were an innocent person, yeah. I would lose my mind. <laughs> so I was, I was almost more scared of that there was a moment I was in the asylum and I don't know if people, I, I imagine everyone can relate to this. You know, when you walk down a hallway, you kind of feel almost pressure of like, if there's doors, like you kind of feel like, you know, the, the sort of like the, the almost like something wants you to look and right. see the race. Right. So because it was the middle of the day, so I didn't have any light source, but it, unbeknownst to me, all the windows and everything were grown over with trees and vines. So everything was pitch black. So you're walking down this blackened hallway um, <laughs> in an asylum that's haunted. 
And just the pressure that there might be something in any of those rooms. And I happened of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. Mm-mm. And <laughs> there's a beat where you're like, did I, did I really see that? And I kind of looked a little bit and this pigeon took off and I would just like, ah, <laughs> I think we both like terrified each other. Like it, it was just that whole time, that whole two and a half hours. I was terrified and I kept forcing myself to go back into the asylum because of the way I felt there. I thought if anything's going to happen, it's going to be there. And I was, I was inside one of the rooms. I think, I think it was an old industrial kitchen or something. And I said, is there anyone there? And nothing. And then I thought, well, that's dumb. If there's any ghosts here, they're going to be Italian. So I said the same thing in Italian. And as soon as I did, woof. There was this big whoop sound right outside where I was standing. So I'm like, okay, maybe I'll spend the rest of my 10 minutes out <laughs> outside. Oh uh, I was so scared. I don't even know how I walked past where that sound had been to get out, to be honest. It was just, I've never been so scared. And I've read people say, oh, we went blueberry picking there and it was so lovely. I don't know why anybody's upset. I'm like, when you are there by yourself, it is another thing altogether. It is terrifying. And you wrote about, I mean, you used that experience when you wrote about um, Lily's story, right? And yeah, yeah, that you could tell, I mean, you were writing from experience because that was creepy reading about it. And I'm like, is this place even real? Like I looked it up and I was like, this is a real place. (laughs) Yes, very much so. There is, um, there's half of the island that's a mass grave of plague victims, but I could never get there I couldn't find it and it wasn't until I got home that I saw an aerial map I'm like oh it was over there um so in my book at least they get to go over there (laughs) I never did I'd love to go back and and go over there but yeah who knows if I ever will (laughs) so there's one of pictures that you um sent me and it looks like a hole in the ground but is that actually what it is Oh, yeah. So this is the thing. So I'm walking (laughs) through these condemned abandoned buildings that I'm not supposed to be in without any light. And all I had was I had a DLSR camera. So I was using the flashes light. And again, how many horror movies, right? I kept expecting something to jump up. (laughs) Um, I was using the flashes light. And when I did that, that was the floor that I was about to walk over. Oh, my goodness. Yes. I'm so glad you had your camera. (laughs) Yeah, me too. Yeah. Some people said it's the stupidest thing I've ever done. Yeah, (laughs) probably. But I'm so glad I did it. But it definitely paid off because when I was reading that story, I was just like, oh my goodness, I'm never going there. (laughs) (laughs) So creepy. Um, All right. So now I have a fun question. Um, What is your favorite cuisine? And why? Oh, boy. Oh, it depends what day it is. Like like cuisine, cuisine, not just like food, but cuisine. Yeah, like, I feel like my favorite cuisine is um, what's what in America we typically call Indian food, even though I know there's so many different regions and, you know, um, but I can eat that anytime. I I love it. So what is your favorite cuisine? Wow. Can I have a tie? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I love Italian food. That That's probably uh, not that interesting. I love Italian food. I love Japanese food. And I also love Ethiopian food very much so, but I have to be, I have to be in the right mood for both Japanese and Ethiopian. If you have, if you have sushi on a day where you don't feel like sushi, it is just the worst thing ever. You have to be in the mood, but yeah, I'd, I'm so sad during COVID, my favorite Ethiopian place closed. So I don't know what I'm going to do because no other place is quite like it. But I love yeah, it. Ethiopian is one of those cuisines I've never had a chance to try. And I've, I've watched so many different like documentary programs about like, it's definitely looks like something that I, I want to try, but there isn't any in my local area. But I think there is some a couple of hours from where I live. So I may have to break down and take a trip one day just to try it. Oh, it's so good. Get Doro Tibbs. So good. I love it. I love it. Uh, your fingers smell afterwards forever. <laughs> well, I, you... I, 
I feel just, like that's a risk you run with anything you might eat. So yeah, that's true. Um, but for comfort food, the Italian, definitely. And going to Italy and actually seeing what real pizza is and what real pasta tastes like, that was mind blowing. Like for a long time, I could never eat pizza here, but I have to think of them as just, they're not the same. Like it's not the, the same, yeah. Yeah, one's pizza and one's something else. Yeah. <laughs> one's Western pizza, or, you know, I couldn't think of them as being the same anymore after I tried Italian pizza. It's just, I know people say that and sound really snobby, but. I don't think so. I, I've not been, but my husband has been, and he's the exact same way. He's like, he likes American pizza, but he doesn't, he's like, that's not real pizza. <laughs> he's like, um... it's okay, but it's not real pizza. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very difficult to eat Italian pizza with your hands. It's so gloppy and, you know, the, the slice goes, mm -hmm. but it's so good. So good. Right. Well, that's good. Um, one more just fun question, and you may not have an answer to this one. Um, do you sing karaoke? And if so, what is your go to song? I don't sing karaoke. Uh, I love to sing, but I'm very, it's weird. I used to be in choirs all through childhood. And even as an adult, uh, this is one of the few times in my life that I haven't been part of a singing group, but I'm very shy about singing in front of people. I'm afraid, I guess I'm afraid they're going to tell me I can't sing. So <laughs> I've never been bold enough to do karaoke. It looks like fun. Um, if I had to pick one though, to sing, I'd probably pick I'll, I will survive. I love that song. <laughs> or I was thinking the other day when, you know, the Smiths, anything by the Smiths, for yeah. some reason, his voice, I can sing along to perfectly. It's not hard for me to hit any note he hits. There's just something about the way he sings that it feels natural to me or an ABBA song. I love yeah. ABBA. I yeah. probably, <laughs> but I will survive. I mean, there's no one that doesn't like that song. Yeah, I, for one, absolutely love to sing karaoke because I cannot sing. It's so uh, much fun to torture people with my voice. <laughs> what's your go-to? Um, I used to sing um, I Love Rock and Roll ah. because it's one of those ones where people will join in with you even if you sound bad and then you don't sound so bad because everyone's singing along with you. So. Well, and it's almost like she's just talking at the beginning too. It, it's not like, a, you know, she's, it's not like my heart will go on or, exactly. I will go on or when people go up and you hear the first few bars of Whitney Houston's version of, I will always love you. I'm like, Oh no. Oh no. Yeah. It's Why really, good or really bad. Yeah. yeah. There are just some songs you shouldn't touch. <laughs> oh yeah. That would be one of them. I'd say. Well, that, that was my last question. Um, I have yeah. had so much fun finally getting to have a conversation with you. <laughs> yeah. I've been yeah. such a fan of your work. <laughs> Aw, thank you so much, Toy. You've been so generous and so kind. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm just so glad you accepted my invitation. <laughs> oh, of course. I was so excited. I've got a question for you, though. Okay. What book of yours do you suggest people start with? Like, of mine? Yes. <laughs> um... I still feel like my work, my fiction is a work in progress, um, but I do have one story that I feel um, is part of one of my collections. It's Legend of the Boy in the Window and other short stories. And I think that story, Legend of the Boy, is if someone's going to read some, some fiction of mine for the first time, that would be the one. Um, and also, my picture books, um, I feel like if someone's going to read one of those for the first time, it would be What Does Joe Need? I think that's a really cute one about teaching kids about needs and wants. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> and pick them up. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, go ahead and tell the viewers where they can find you or your work online. Okay, well, if you can spell my last name, that's a good start. <laughs> People can. Uh, you can find me on my website at jhmoncrief.com. And then from there, really any social media that I'm on. I'm not on Twitter anymore, uh, but I'm a big fan of TikTok, obviously. And Facebook, you can just search J.H. Moncrief and you'll find me. I'm easy to find. <laughs> um, all right. So. Um, everyone, be sure to stick around for the credits because JH is sharing a trailer for the Ghost Rider series. It's really cool. Um, to my Patreon supporters, stick around. She has some exclusive content just for you. 
And until next time, everyone stay safe, be blessed and have fun reading. Bye.